and I welcome you all to the virtual health and social care scrutiny subcommittee meeting. Can you hear me, Julian? We can hear you, Councillor. OK. Yes, quite clearly. OK. Present are members and advisor of the subcommittee, council officers, partner organizations, and the portfolio holder for adults and public health. Can I refer members and officers to the published protocols for holding virtual meetings? Please note the following. Members of the subcommittee should ensure that they have their videos on at all times, but to put microphones on mute unless speaking. Other members and officers should switch off their videos and put microphones on the mute until they are invited to speak. In case of a technical problem, the meeting will be adjourned until the issue is resolved. If the technical problem persists and the meeting is incorrect, the meeting will be abandoned and rearranged for a later date. The meeting is being audio and video recorded and will be available to watch or listen to on, on the website. <clears throat> I would like to remind everyone that given the number of items we have on the agenda tonight, we will use timings to ensure we get through all the items and in reasonable time and given all the presenters an opportunity to, opportunity to speak. Perhaps that we vary the order of uh, business and move item to number 11, mental health review, mental health strategy, up the agenda. So <clears throat> it can be heard as a first substantial item after item six reference from other council committees. Is that agreed? Hello? Mm, agreed. Fine by yeah. me. Thank you. Yeah. OK, number one, attendance by reserve members. There are none. Declaration of interest. The declarations of interest have been published on the. Council's website and will be taken as read. I understand Councillor Proctor has declared non pecuniary interest in relation to item seven on Mount Vernon Hospital. Do other members of the committee have any more declaration of interest to make? <clears throat> uh, yes, I'd like to if there is any uh, public health uh, matters, public health England, then I uh, work for public health England and it, it will be not on pecuniary interest. OK, thank you. Has everyone got their camera on? Yes. I'll turn mine on. I think yeah, now I can see I can't see people. If you have your camera on, it will help, please. OK, minutes of the last meeting. Can we approve the minutes of the meeting held on 24th of June 2020? Yes, agreed. Yes. Thank agreed. You. OK, now we go to public questions. One public question has been received. Would Anne Freeman like to ask a question which is addressed to me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'll, I'll read my question out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this is addressed to you, Chair. Thank you. Why have organisations based at the bridge and supporting people affected by mental illness, both patients and family carers, been asked to clear their effects, give back their keys and find other meeting places? And this is linked to agenda item 11. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Please note that the subcommittee does not have decision making powers and decision on the on this matter will fall within the 
remit of the executive power. However, as we have an item on uh, mental health on the agenda, I will raise your question during the debate, which I hope uh, will provide you with an answer. We have changed the order of business, so the presentation on mental health review will be on the first item. On the basis, do you have supplemental question to ask? Um, well, it depended on the answer, of course. Um, but um, coming to the point is, um, is the bridge going to close? Thank you. Um, and why I should actually add is Wise Works and the bridge going to close because okay. they were part of the um, consultation or the review that the consultant Shirley Reagan um, did for the council. OK, thank you. And I will uh, raise the que this question during the debate and uh, response uh, to return the question information. One second. COVID has presented unprecedented challenges to providers to maintain their complete offer of services and maintain the government's COVID guidelines. And Chair, or, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we need to move on to item uh, next item petitions. Sorry. Well, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Petitions, are there any petitions? Hello? None? We, haven't we haven't received any petitions, Chair. OK, thank you. References from council and other committee slash panels. There are no references, right? None, none received, Chair. OK, number 11 is mental health strategy, mental health review. Would Paul Hewitt, Corporate Director of People, introduce the presentation? Uh, thank you, Paul. Can I invite you to pre present the? Thank you. So good evening, councillors, and good evening, members of the public and colleagues. Thank you uh, for being here this evening. Just to say a little bit about this item, which will be presented by means of a slide deck. The aim is to bring together the mental, the emerging mental health strategy, which our public health team have been working on, um, and the direction of travel for that uh, mental health strategy, alongside the mental health review, which was started prior to COVID, but finished very recently, um, and had a number of findings, which are going to inform um, the way forward for the model of delivering our mental health services here in Harrow. Uh, we do want to emphasise that this is um, a model that we want to co-produce and the strategy we believe will reflect that. So the first bit of the slide deck will be presented by Carol Furlong, the Director of Public Health, and then there'll be other officers pre presenting the uh, the mental health review um, and they will come on the call at the appropriate time. We'll then have the question that Anne has posed at the end and we'll have uh, um, uh, some responses to that. So I hope that's OK. If Carol could come on to the call now. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm going to put the slide deck up. Carol, we have 30 minutes for this item. Is that enough? Yeah, that's plenty. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Right. So, um, slide show on. So, th so this has been pre prepared by Lawrence Gibson, who's my consultant, and Andrea um, uh, Lagos, who is our public health strategist, is leading on mental health. Um, uh, unfortunately, Lawrence can't be here tonight because his father-in-law has fallen over and uh, 
uh, Lawrence is at hospital with him. Um, so uh, I'm uh, I'm a poor stand-in, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so we just wanted a few words, first of all, about the burden of mental ill health um, and thinking about before COVID, we know that one in four adults um, suffer uh, from a, a common mental health disorder. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we know, we know all the facts, you know, uh, uh, about the, the extent of, uh, of mental illness um, and we know that it affects a lot, a lot of people. Um, What's become quite apparent um, with COVID is that a lot of the people who are affected by poor mental health um, is actually the, the same group of people that uh, are affected by COVID. So it's very closely associated with, um, oops, sorry, uh, with age, uh, with occupation, with uh, long people with long term conditions, and obviously uh, uh, the uh, black and minority ethnic communities as highlighted in the uh, uh, the uh, the report that was done uh, earlier in the year by Public Health England. So refugees and asylum seekers and particularly our Somali and Afghan and Tamil populations and uh, and other populations as well. Um, so uh, we've been looking at um, the impact of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 um, and uh, how it's been affecting our mental health services. Um, and what we know is that uh, more people have been experiencing depression, anxiety and mental health. Um, and it's actually about double of what it was last year. But because of the uh, the lockdown that we had, which is quite extensive through through the, the spring, we've had a lot fewer referrals into the psychological therapy services um, uh, than we did last at the same time last year. So we have an increasing problem, and we have a, a, a decreasing um, response to to that to that problem, or we have a decreasing response to that problem, um, and um, we've now. Uh, sort of reverse that trend and we're seeing an increase in the number uh, of referrals and the CAM service received the largest number of referrals that they'd ever had in July. Mm -hmm. We've had various surveys that have been done which show that children are being affected um, by the, uh, the uh, lockdown and by worries about COVID um, and 32% had uh, much worse mental health and our digital provider COOS reported 58% increase in activity compared to the same time last year. Um, if we're looking at what's going to happen looking forward as a result of COVID, we can expect to see around uh, 1,400 people with common mental health disorders, up, but possibly up to 28,000, and an extra uh, 1,300 who are on the care programme ap approach which is the framework of assessment and treatment for people on mental health uh, uh, with mental health conditions. And our local services are going to need to adapt and plan for this new deterioration in well-being of the wider population. And that's one of the things that we want to sort of look at um, uh, as part of our, our uh, work on improving pu uh, public mental health. So we've got a long history of policy and I'm also not going to go through the, the long policy history. But safe to say that we've identified lots of different areas in mental health um, that um, we've been working on. It's a huge area um, or to, to tackle um, in the same way that physical health is. It affects us in so many different ways um, and so many different levels. Um, but our health and wellbeing strategy, the Harrow Borough Plan, which the council have worked on, and the out of hospital recovery plan and the integrated care work of trying to bring together all of the work that, that we're doing on mental health. Um, we're looking at it on this life, life course approach and also looking at it in terms of this uh, tiered approach um, uh, according to severity. So we start at the bottom with um, a, how, how we can support everybody to have good mental health and work on their resilience so that when they are faced with difficulties, 
um, that they they're resilient enough to be able to cope with with new things that that happen to them. Uh, and then when uh, we have got people who've got problems, start early and identify the, the communities that are at risk and the individuals that are at risk, so that we can actually uh, do something about it. We start start with the tier one services, which are the, the lowest level of services, working all the way up to the uh, tier four and tier five uh, specialist services. Um, and there's a whole uh, lot of examples of the, the sort of services that, that we're talking about. Um, and not to not to sort of think about um, the, you know, make things being quite minor, but things like loneliness from uh, from being so isolated for so long is having a really bad impact on on quite a lot of us. Um, not least working from home, you know, we're, we're all working from home and not having that contact with our colleagues that affects our mental health as well. Um, so we've been we've been looking at um, services for young people and the way that we want to work, work with um, schools and. Um, because we, we see this as a being a, a real vital underpinning of uh, of the mental health strategy, um, we've been doing lots of training with them um, over the the last year or so um, uh, on mental health first aid and mental health and resilience. We've done lots of workshops, um, uh, we've done parenting workshops uh, uh, and workshops for parents on mental health. Um, and looking at a whole school approach so that, you know, the, the, the schools can actually help identify children who've got problems early and uh, look at their, uh, at how that fits in with their life, not just, not just the, uh, how they, they, they react to school, but to, uh, to try and identify children um, and young people who've got problems um, as early as possible. Um, and we are part of the, um, uh, NHS England's mental health support team uh, rollout, um, and we we were successful in our application for that. But we have this complex um, picture of the provision for for young people. Um, we've got different commissioners. We've got school commissioners and local authority commissioners, CCG commissioners, some joint commissioning with the, uh, the local authority and the CCG. Um, uh, for, for Harrow, then we've got London Northwest, um, uh, which is increasingly being being our, our commissioner. Things like the voluntary sector commission. It brings this very complicated picture, and it's really important that we have that that thread going through it, so that it's not seen as siloed working and uh, and not seen not seen as an individual service. That we actually need to work. Um, across these different silos to bring them all together to to, to have a service that is uh, comprehensive and uh, people don't fall through the gaps. And we've been uh, using the Thrive model to map the services. So the Thrive model is about um, preventing uh, mental Ill health, promoting uh, good mental health, and uh, and uh, supporting uh, young people to thrive. Um, and so it's about getting help um, for uh, the lower level conditions and then getting more help if you need it um, with the services, getting support for uh, if you're in a higher risk group, so like the young youth offending team and the uh, youth justice team. Um, and then uh, and getting advice for, for everyone. So, that, so there's a um, uh, a comprehensive list of, of places where people can get advice. The next slide, I think I'm going to hand over to Jo, um, who's going to talk about the strategic review that's been going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So I'm going to talk um, through the uh, mental health review that Adult Social Care Commission to look at the efficiency and effectiveness of the pathways um, for that support mental health recovery for adults. I think that many of the things that uh, Carol has alluded to in terms of the complexity of the landscape for mental health is actually applicable to adults as well. So the council commissions 
services for to support mental health. We also directly provide services. We commission CNWL and also the CCG commission services. So I think it is quite a, a complex picture in terms of understanding how as a system all those elements come together. And I think it's key that we recognise that there are a multitude of providers in that space as well that are probably not mo the most coordinated um, as we would possibly like. So the local authority commissioned the mental health review at the end of uh, 2019 and it was undertaken predominantly in the spring of this year. Unfortunately it wasn't possible to fully complete as we'd intended but um, we were able to, we felt it was sufficiently complete to, um, to move forward with the recommendations. The methodology that was adopted used um, service users and people with lived experience of services both commissioned and directly provided. We engaged with a number of um, with Harrow Carers, CNWL, Rethink um, to identify people that could participate in a series of focus groups um, talking about uh, uh, aspects of their of, of mental health, including where I live, being part of my community, advice and information. The one aspect that we weren't able to complete that we will need to come back to was about employment and pathways into employment and supporting employment. So that is an area that we need to further develop. On this slide, you'll see a number of um, services that are actually part of the offer in, in Harrow. I'm not sure if it's that clear, but that's the um, that th there are some of the services that are listed. Carol, can you move on to the next one? Thank you. So I think it's important to acknowledge that there is there are lots of independent interdependencies with mental health. So we're very much working in a context that we've got the integrated care partnership. So looking across Northwest London, we're also working with Harrow CCG. We've got the new model of community hubs that um, CNWL are implementing, aligning them with the, um, the PCNs. We've got the out of hospital plan that's being developed and implemented, the recovery pathways, and we, we've, we want to adopt a very strong person centred community approach for Harrow. So the key findings of the report are, are are, are listed here and I think one of the, the points again and it does relate to a point that Carol, uh, Carol made is that the review found that there was a lot of silo working within and by organisations and that really was the result of not having a very strategic approach so I think that that's something that we can that I think service users are very clear about and that we can we need to develop and I'm ambitious and optimistic that the integrated care partnership will really help us to achieve some of that those the joined up working we are the, they also found that the there was um that the provided service were not always enabling recovery but creating it more of a dependency culture and actually we needed to move to more of a person-centered support particularly around the community-based offer so I'm, i'll come back to that one specifically there was recognition that there wasn't the right accommodation pathway to support recovery and to um, enable people to live independently. And we have set up a, a, we are undertaking a piece of work looking specifically at the accommodation pathway. What do we currently have in place? What do we do we need? What are the, what's, what are the needs that are coming through the system that we can't meet? that we're struggling to meet that we don't meet well and actually do we have a, a pathway that enables recovery and, and for people to move on through in terms of accommodation and where they live. The review found as well that there was a lack of recognition of the value and the offer from the voluntary sector and I think that this is something that's been really reinforced through Covid and the experience of how the voluntary sector has um, really galvanised the, the offer in Harrow through the community hub and by extending and, and shaping their own services, offering specific services and activities support to uh, the diverse population of Harrow. And even prior to, to, the, to COVID and that huge response, the review had acknowledged that there was more that we could do to, that we needed to be doing to really embrace the offer and the value of the, of the BCS across Harrow. 
So we are looking at how we can actually work more collaboratively with the VCS to develop our offer across a, a range of services and how we can build on their, their local experience for specific supporting specific communities, but also looking at where they have a national or a regional offer or a, a way of working. How can we benefit and learn from, from some of that experience? So the working th with the VCS is absolutely critical. We do already, but I think that we, we need to extend that even further. There was also recognition in the review that the that there wasn't a sufficient offer to carers and again through covid that has that's something else that has been highlighted the the immense support that carers provide to a number of vulnerable people and how we need to ensure that the carers are supported in that role um, to continue that role but also to to have the right infrastructure around there Carers doesn't stand in isolation and it's a, an aspect that has been picked up in the out of hospital plan as well as within the council where we've uh, created a carer support post recently. So we need to ensure that we join up our approaches to developing the offer for carers as well. I'm just going to come back to the 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 finding around the community based services because I think this is an area that we we do need to develop and I just want to explain a bit more about that. So Carol, if you could just move the slide, that would be great. Thank you. So in terms of the community based offer, I think it's very important that we we have some we agree some principles and that to help us really shape and detail the vision that we're looking to achieve. So we're very clear that we want a holistic approach that's sustainable across the whole the whole um, across this whole system but actually that it's co-produced with Harrow residents and service users. I think it's really that there's it look at moving forward it's co-production is, is going to be absolutely key to developing a, an offer and a model of service delivery that meets the range of people's needs and recognising the different needs of people that we are commissioning services to, to support. So co-production, we, we've done some in Harrow, we've, we have, we've got a, a very good track record with a project that we undertook to design and commission Harrow Horizons, which is a service for young people. And actually we need to develop our ability to work with with partners and partners to work with us in a co-production environment so that there is transparency and understanding about how models are developed and that they're owned by by both the users the providers and the commissioners so that's something very that's running through very much our work at the moment we need to make sure as well that doing this work that we're supporting people's health and well-being during covid there have been because of the the um, social distancing and the requirements for us to remain safe in a covid environment the services in terms of the the um, activity based face to face small group work has actually in with physical presence has now all ceased and there have been a lot of there's been a lot of creative work around developing new ways of working through video um, links virtual offers using various platforms which whilst it doesn't replace face to face activity it's certainly an element of an offer which we will expect to continue and develop further post post um, covid but also to look at enhancing it during and this period we also know that looking forward, we need to be able to accommodate and support the, those emerging needs that have arisen as a result of COVID. So we know that there will be an increase in mental health illness as a result of unemployment, financial stress and bereavement. So that, that, that's already been experienced, the increase in um, presentations, but we need to be able to respond to that over a period of time, maybe over the next couple of years. And we also need to make sure that moving forward that we have a, a, a resilient model and providers are very much central to shaping that with service users. OK, Carol. Next slide, please. Sorry. It's OK. So in developing a, the 
the, 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 our approach to developing our community model is very much about a co-production um, approach, but also starting with the person and what are the, what are the person's needs in a range of dimensions, social, their lifestyle, skills and experience, volunteering, etc. So that we start off with a with the person and build the service uh, service around them at the right place in the right time. So so very much starting from that position of, of a person centred approach. Carol, the next one. In addition to that, another strand of the community based model is also looking at the, the, the plethora of, of opt opportunities that the community offer, the, the community has, both in terms of the personal community, the friendships, the family, the neighbours, etc. around the person, but also looking at what is the community offer that is available and how can that be seem to be part of, of the offer, the richness of the offer. So we've got, we've got a strand there around parks, cafes, shopping centres, etc. So that there is a combination of um, opportunities and provision within the local community, as well as specific um, to supporting people with mental health. And then we've got the two, two outer rings of the community-based health, health and social care, but also the, the acute at the outset. I'm now going to hand over to Angela because we've got a, a slide which explains a tiered approach to which is being evolved in Somerset, which tries, which I'm hoping will sort of explain how we're looking at a strategic approach with with different levels of support. Again, it's similar to the one that Carol explained for children. So if Carol, if you can move on to the next slide and Angela, if you could explain the tiered models, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Good evening. So um, as Joe said, it's really important that we put the um, person at the centre of this and we've been looking out um, nationally for good practice. Um, there are um, Somerset have got an emerging uh, model which has been evaluated and is demonstrating some really good practice. Um, so it's about ensuring that the person has that access when they need it. So there are five stages starting from their uh, emotional well-being and the support that you need to be able to maintain your emotional well-being um, and that could be everything from um, social prescribing, health coaches, informal networks, enabling the person to connect with their community and acting as a connector there from them. Um, to then moving up through the, the stages, um, looking at um, whether you need some specialist intervention, some specialist therapy uh, for the community support or indeed an acute um, um, medical um, help. Now, these, these stages aren't linear and many of us will go through our life with uh, mental health needs and we'll be able to, if, if you're able to access the, very importantly, that the, the support when you need it, that will enable you to um, continue with your, um, engage your connections with the community, your employment or your volunteering, um, and, and, we'll give, and we'll be able to give that uh, wraparound support to individuals. Joe, I don't know whether you want to go on to the next steps or would you like me to? Sorry, Joe, you on mute. If you just do the next, the last, the last yeah. years, then okay. we can go to the next step. So the so the next steps in how obviously to, um, as, as Joe has said previously, um, and, and this actually reflects um, very much um, what Carol has been talking about with her model, is to establish a co-production with group with membership from all stakeholders. Very importantly to ensure that that co-production is with people who've got lived experiences of mental health needs to look at the redesign of the community support services network as part of a whole system approach to the recovery and resilience. So that's across voluntary sector, us as uh, council officers and services, uh, our colleagues in health, and, and to develop this recovery pathway that provides this um, wraparound holistic response and enables people to transition from inpatients to their own home, or as they, if they become uh, unwell in the community that they can access that right support when they need it to continue um, with um, living like we'd all like to live, you know, in employment, by volunteering, connecting with our community and feeling a valued member of the community. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and the final slide just brings together the, the combination of the public health 
elements that Carol covered as part of the evolving strategy and the mental health that for adult social care. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions and comments on the presentation? So, Chair, is this the time to deal with the question raised by a member of the public? Can yeah, we deal with I, that question uh, first? Please, um, please. Maybe please. Anne would like to come on and just repeat the question. You want me to repeat it or? And sure, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And would you like to ask the question again? All right, I'm ready. Right. Yes. And my question is, why have organisations based at the bridge and supporting people affected by mental illness, both patients and family carers, been asked to clear their effects, give back their keys and find other meeting places? So thank you very much uh, for your question. A very important one is clearly had an effect on people in the way that it's been um, couched. So what I'm going to do is bring um, Alex Dewsnap onto the call. Alex is the senior responsible officer who's been working on the risk assessment, the COVID risk assessment for the bridge, because the um, context of what you've just described is the risk assessment in relation to COVID. So, Alex, would you like to just come on the call and respond to the question? Sure. Thank, thanks, Paul, and, and thanks for the for the for the question, Anne. Uh, so, my name is Alex Dewsnap. So I'm the director of strategy and partnerships for the council. And um, during the COVID era, one of the things that I have inherited is the um, responsible officer designation for the bridge currently. Now, with all properties and premises at this moment in time, it's important that all agencies carry out what's called a COVID risk assessment for those premises. And in doing so, um, I've, me and my team have led this with support from some of the experts across the council to understand what type of services it is safe to actually run from the site. So as a result of that risk assessment being completed over the last month or so, we have concluded that service user based services are too risky to run from the bridge on the basis that the only mitigations that we would be able to put in place for, for good circulation of air would be to have windows open at all time, as well as also having to put in place a significant cleaning regime. We'd have to limit numbers of people as and when they'll be able to come in and also have to successfully socially distance when actually people are in there. And obviously we are curtailed by the fact that the room layout and the layout of the bridge in order to get good flows of individuals in and out in a safe way also doesn't necessarily help. So we've come to the conclusion that in effect for the bridge during the COVID era, it is not safe to actually have services running from there. As part of that risk assessment, we have also looked at the community hub, which in effect is our food support to vulnerable residents and families within Harrow, uh, which we set up initially for shielded individuals back in March, but have continued that throughout the pandemic, even when the lockdown was finished, on the basis that there was high demand for those sorts of services. And given the nature of that service, we don't feel that that should stop because we think that the mitigations that we can put in place to safely operate that service uh, can, can continue. So it's basically those service user based services, and that is a similar conclusion to some extent that we have drawn across the neighbourhood resource centres, across other adult social care settings, for instance. So from that perspective, that will be the reason why service users, et cetera, and services that offer mental health services from the bridge have been asked uh, not at this stage to come back or to run from the building. Thank you, Alex. And I think Anne may have a supplemental question. And what, well, yes, I mean, relating to that, no doubt you realise, Mr. Jusnap, that um, neither the Rethink Mental Illness official services nor the groups have in fact been meeting since March. 
Um, I'm one of the voluntary coordinators of Harrow Rethink Support Group, and we've sure. run quite a few, have been running quite a few activities there, but we haven't been in the building since. No, I, I, I appreciate that, yes. You're, you're, so it was a bit of a shock to say, well, you can imagine, come in, take your effects, hand over your keys, and find somewhere else for your services. Sure. But, um, we, you know, for 36 years, we've been providing services at pretty good value for money. I'm sure you would agree. Um, some of our activities have got national awards, even sure. though we don't charge. Uh, and, you know, people, um, you know, have thrived. My own son has thrived with the choir. Um, because he, you know he, he became ill with schizophrenia when he went to music college, so his standard of music is, is you know that was his life, and he went to the choir and he realised that perhaps he could still have a go at it, um, and, and and this is what happened on a personal level. Um, so we do provide pretty good value for money, and it sort of fits in with your. Um, plans for the future. So, you know, we, we don't we we fundraise. We don't. Uh, when the council had the last uh, a lot of cuts and they didn't give us money for to print our newsletter, um, but, you know, we made sure that we raised funds. You know, we're self sufficient. So it wasn't a, a bit of a shock, I can tell you. Um, could I add Wise Works to this question? Maybe it's it, it, I shouldn't really do that, but. I believe there are changes at Wiseworks, like there are changes at Bridge. So I suppose coming down to it, my basic question is, um, is this the end of the Bridge and Wiseworks as we know it? Because today at another Zoom meeting, I met the new manager of the Bridge. Complete shock. You know, the communication, some people we know have started self-harming. They're so worried about the future they might be dependent on the bridge but but what goes on at the bridge maintains them and gradually people with severe mental illness will get back into the community but it takes a long time not six months it could take six years or ten sure. years for it to happen so sorry to ramble on but um it, it, you know quite a shock today to meet the new manager of, the, of um, Wiseworks um, and, and, you know, does this mean this is the end of life as we knew it? We knew, yes. Have we got to find another building where the choir can meet? Support group can meet where the borderline personality training and support group for carers can meet. Borderline is not allocated any um, time by CNWL or the council. You know, I could go on, I know, but we are, I think we're doing pretty good work. So I'm, I'm a bit sad that, you know, we're having to do catch up in a rather sad manner. So so I, I guess ultimately, if as the local authority, we haven't got the communications right and the engagement right on that, can only apologise on, on the basis that, that that's not right and we need to put that right. In terms of any future engagement, I think on the basis that Cabinet has considered the, the mental health strategies as Joe, Carol and Angela have outlined uh, this evening, I think one of the next stages will be to, to come out and do the engagement with the voluntary sector, with community groups such as yourself, because I think the, gen, the genuine and authentic approach that we want to put in place is a co-produced solution so that we get the right services, so that those things that you've just talked about, Anne, are put in place, but they're put in place in an enhanced way in, in and ultimately better outcomes can be delivered for all service users. OK, can I just interrupt? We need to get on. We've done over 40, 45 minutes. We've got other items. I've got other councillors. They want to come on. So can we stop now, please? Could Sorry. I have a look at my question? Well, can I say, uh, we'll send you the reply in writing. Because I've got other people, seven people waiting to ask questions and uh, oh God, way no. over half an hour now. I think I heard an answer. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but I'll make sure you get rep uh, replied in, you know, written reply. And then if you have any queries, you can write them back email. 
Thank you. Reply to the email, okay? Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Take care. Okay, Councillor Veena Mithani. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question um, uh, to Carol, uh, thank you for um, a very good presentation. It was uh, detailed with your colleagues. Uh, my concern is because of this COVID, um, how are we sort of uh, looking after young uh, uh, adults because they are prone to uh, sort of mental health uh, illnesses? And I saw about the crisis and everything. So are they sort of like um, able to get into the right services uh, quickly or is there a long uh, sort of procedure and a waiting list? Um, yeah, we have we have a lot of, um, of online support um, which uh, young people are using quite extensively, uh, like the COOP service um, and uh, I think I think they 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 actually re really like that. Um, we have the the um, the service, the Hara Horizon service, um, which is also doing um, a, a really great job at the moment. And we do have the obviously the the more um, the higher level um, mental health services, um, which are coping but are. Um, under strain, like a lot of services are at the moment, because they're having a lot more a lot more referrals. Um, uh, yeah, I think everybody's trying to do the 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 best that they can. You know, in in this really difficult time, you know, it's unprecedented, and we're um, we're trying to respond in the be the best way uh, that we can. I don't know whether any of our health colleagues who might be on um, want to say about what's going on. Uh, I'm, I'm, hi, it's Tanya Paxton here, Borough Director for. Hi, Tanya. Hi. I mean, hi, Tanya. Just, Sorry. Really, hi. Just to really echo echo that um, mental health services are particularly busy at the moment. There has been, you know, a, a significant increase in referrals coming in via GP practices and coming in via A and E. But we are managing those, and we are making sure that everybody is being assessed at an appropriate time. And we're taking forward the treatment. There has been a new um, transformation that's just been embedded. And just listening to you, Anne, and some of your anxieties, um, I really just wanted to, to share that there, there is investment coming into mental health now. Um, there's significant investment coming from NHS England, and we are looking finally at having a proper care pathway for those with complex emotional needs, so the borderline personality disorder patient population, there is investment coming in the new financial year to actually support with a really comprehensive pathway for those. So whilst we are struggling with COVID and whilst there's lots going on, there's also some good stuff over the horizon. Thank you. Can I call on Natasha? Is the camera on? Natasha Proctor, Councilor yeah, Natasha. Yeah, I'm on the whole time, don't worry, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, great. My camera's on. Um, thank you to Carol, Angela and Joe for that presentation and running us through everything. Um, I've got two questions. I'll make them really quick. First of all, I wondered if you could share with us if we've had any specific information from the schools, um, whether it's primary schools we're seeing issues as well or if it's high schools specifically and if there are any kind of big charges in certain aspects of mental health that they've been reporting back in younger people. Um, and my second question is, more referring to adults, um, the pathway looks fantastic. I'm wondering if there's any specific elements that are going to be pushed up, so to speak, when we see towards the end of March when furlough comes to an end. Um, I know you said unemployment is obviously one of the issues that can spur on mental health um, illnesses. Um, I, I'm sure it's in the plans anyway, but I just wondered if you could let us know if there's anything specific that we're working towards in expectations that there might be another shift upwards in the amount of referrals we're getting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think we, you know, we are we are predicting that that there will be um, increases across the board. Um, schools, um, I think, are, are seeing um, uh, children and young people sort of expressing anxiety and worries about about COVID, um, and 
you know, the, just the difficulties of, of uh, not seeing their friends and, you know, it, it's not normal life for them. Um, and I was trying to support uh, um, the children by doing things creatively when they do have to do things online. Um, I, you know, I'm not making it all about doing their work and making it seem like life is uh, just constantly doing homework. Um, so, I, you know, I, um, I, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things like that that are, that are going on. Um, but I do, yeah, I do anticipate that the, there will be a surge in in, in need for mental health um, uh, interventions, um, not least because of the you know the impact financially that this has had on the population, and that is a huge predictor um, of of uh, mental health problems, uh, depression, uh, and anxiety, and an exacerbation of uh, other more severe mental health uh, problems as well. Sorry, Tanya, I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to say that predictory. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to be swamped. <laughs> Fine. We're preparing. Yeah, yeah, I think every, everybody's looking at, at that, yeah. Cool, I thought so. Okay, thank you for your answers. Okay, yeah. What about Councillor Michael Borio? You, you wanted to ask a question? Um, yes, Chair. Actually, the, the question I had is it was already asked about schools, so um, I'm fine. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, I just have one question. What do service users and their friends stroke family say about current service provision and future design? Hello? Right, so if, if I respond to that one to start off with, so we included the feedback from the review about the, so as part of the review we gathered the responses and views of um, service users and carers to inform the recommendations and moving forward we're going to be work because of we, we we are really committed to a co-production approach we will be working with those with service users and um, carers in terms of designing what the new services are actually like so their voices will be um, a continuum or continued in that process i think just on the current offer i just wanted to um picking up a bit on Councillor Proctor's question in terms of the offer rethink are working with um, WiseWorks to actually keep evolving and developing the the services that are available the opportunities that are, are available in terms of opportunity of um, on a virtual basis and I, I know that they have also been speaking with economic development within the council to see if what the link up is in terms of supporting employment or or developing skills for employment. So we can keep you updated in terms of that. Thank you. OK, can I ask Genevieve to speak, please? Thank you, Chair. I, I was just going to make the point that, um, that uh, as Tanya and Carol have said, that mental health issues, absolutely, we're waiting. We're, we're looking at, at how people are presenting, but I have to say, just from a general practice perspective, I don't think I could get through a consultation at the moment without a degree of um, of understanding about the pressure that people in general are feeling in their day to day lives. And that is having a knock on effect to the way that they're presenting with their physical conditions, as well as when they directly um, present with um, with uh, mental health uh, issues. And I think that we have seen a large increase in the amount of mental health um, issues that people are feeling that they need to um, discuss. But also, and I suppose this is why I wanted to make the point, as, as this is a, you know, you're in, in a position of, uh, of, of influences within the community. Um, I think that people feel that they shouldn't be asking for help um, because they feel like this is something that they should be able to, that everybody's in the same boat, that everybody should be able to kind of manage this. But I think that we would all recognise this is an extraordinary time and it is going to have a huge impact on everybody. And it's just so important that people feel the have the ability to speak up when they do actually feel that they are distressed in any way, because 
as Tanya said, there are services there for people and we really want to um, support them early. So, so I suppose it's, um, it's about how we provide that mental health first aid um, and, and make sure that we are, are really there for the whole community, uh, whether it is uh, children and young people or um, the whole age ranges as uh, uh, in that whole life course approach, as Carol mentioned right at the very beginning. So, um, so I just thought it was worth uh, mentioning that this is, this is general health conversations at the moment. Thank you. I have Councillor Christine Robson who would like to come in. Christine? Hello? Is she there? Okay, I have uh, a portfolio holder. I'll, I'll ask him to come in. Simon Thank Brown, you. please. Okay, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yes, I, I would very much support the strategy uh, and the review that we've heard about this evening and, and my thanks go out, out to all those who worked so hard uh, on preparing this. For me, I guess there are, there are three words, three words that are important and those are person, recovery and independence. It's so important that we take a person-centred approach and by that I mean concentrate on the person, on their family, on their carers. Um, secondly is recovery, the recovery pathway. We must be clear that we have a pathway from start to end. What we must avoid is people getting stuck along that pathway and I think this review gives us the chance to co-produce and design that with our partners. And the third one is independence, to promote independence so our residents have independence in living, the opportunity to return to work, to return to training, to live in their community in a normal life. And these are, are really important points to me and what I expect this review and strategy to drive forward in the future. And, and then just to come back on, on Anne's and Freeman's point, I have to say we just don't know when and how we will be able to return to our building based services. Uh, we just don't know um, at the moment. So surely I know that the review team will be engaging with the community groups to talk through this about how the services may look in the future. But I must make clear we have made absolutely no decisions at all about closing any of the buildings at this stage. All we know is that at the moment until COVID clears to an extent, we just can't safely use them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, would Angela Morris like to say something? Hello? Hello, sorry, I do apologise. I lost connection there. I wasn't sure if you were asking okay. me a question or not. So okay. just to let you know, I am here. OK. Thank you. Sorry, it was such a small picture. I couldn't see who it was. OK, thank you. OK, I think we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. Mount Vernon uh, Cancer Centre. Can we, uh, sorry, subcommittee note the update of last item? Noted. <clears throat> OK, now we go back to the uh, agenda. Mount Vernon Cancer Center Review Update, November 2020. We have now have a presentation from representative of NHS England and NHS Improvement. The presentation has been published and is part of the agenda packs. Therefore, I propose that only a brief in introduction be given so the committee can spend more time on the questions and answers. We will have approximately 20 minutes for this item. Would Ruth, Derek and uh, Jasmine Kingpon introduce the report in brief? Thank you, Chair. I think Jessamy is going to introduce the item and then we'll take questions and answers along with Susan Sinclair from Northwest London ICS, who's also with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you ever so much for having us here tonight. Um, you're as you've said, the um, uh, 
presentations already been circulated, so I just thought I'd, I'd pick out some some of the key points really. Um, the Mount Vernon Cancer Centre, um, as you can see from the map that was in the pack, covers a very big area of about um, two million people. Um, the, the, it also takes in about um, nine percent of its population come from Harrow. Um, and you can see um, on one of the slides that that over a three year period equates to just over a thousand. So it's just over a thousand patients, in, individual patients per year. Um, and the reason that we're looking at the review of the centre um, is because of some clinical clinicians that brought some concerns to our attention um, last year. We started the review and had an independent clinical team come in and have a look at things. And if you've been to the site, you'll know that the buildings are in a really bad state. Um, but it was it was more than that. There are a, a limited range of support services on the site. So things like intensive care and high dependency. And as a result, some of the poorest patients can't be treated at Mount Vernon. And what was happening at the time of the review was that if a patient at Mount Vernon deteriorated, they would need to be transferred to an acute hospital. Now, since the review, the admissions criteria has been tightened up so that there are less transfers happening, but there are also less patients being admitted to Mount Vernon. Most of them will be admitted directly to another acute hospital um, and that manages their risk. But it means that the oncology staff don't have that access and input into them um, as easily for their oncology treatment. And there are a whole number of reasons which um, are set out in this pack as to, to why not having those clinical support facilities is getting uh, more and more important uh, an issue. And that includes that patients are living longer and with more comorbidities, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to run specialised cancer services on a site that does not have all of that support infrastructure. And as a result, the staff aren't getting the exposure to the um, all of the treatments that they could be and patients aren't getting access at Mount Vernon to all of the treatments they could be. They're having to go into central London, for example. Um, now, patients already travel quite a long way to the hospital, so um, we, we're keen that Mount Vernon should be able to do as much as it can. Um, and as a result of the clinical review, there were there were two sort of medium long term things um, happening. One of them is the, the transfer of the management of the service to UCLH that does not change the location of the service that's purely about it being managed by a regional um, cancer specialist um, with all of the research and development background and with the clinical leadership um, to support the Mount Vernon Centre um, but also that the um, that at least some of the services um, so the inpatient services and all the services that that uh, depend on inpatients or inpatients require so services like brachytherapy and uh, some radiotherapy as well would need to move on to an acute site if the cancer centre was to continue to provide those services. Um, now there are possibilities for the cancer centre to be able to provide some of the services that it can't do at the moment if it had the right support infrastructure. It can't have that infrastructure on the existing site. So what we've been looking at um, and we are still looking at uh, are, are the options that might be available to us to move the cancer centre either as a whole uh, onto an acute site or as a whole, but with a, a what we're calling an ambulatory centre or a day hospital on another site. And we've been doing a lot of work around the modelling of transport and access and what that would like look like if we moved it to different places and um, engaging with uh, all of our stakeholders with um, the ICSs, as, as, as you'll see, I mean, we, we have um, Susan here from Northwest London um, and with patients and the public to really try and understand the impact of potential options. Um, and the intention is that, that by Christmas um, we'll have got to a, a short list of possible sites that we could work with that have the right clinical facilities and um, aren't uh, ruled out because of access issues. We don't particularly want to increase any travelling times. Um, we certainly from the east of England, there are people having very, very long journeys. Some of the patients that we have been talking to have told us of car journeys in excess of an hour and a half each way. And if they're relying on public transport, um, I had one patient who told me that their journey was around about five hours. Um, and 
we've also heard from patients who are choosing not to have treatment because they can't face the journey times. So we certainly aren't looking to make the journey times longer for the, the patients um, facing the most extreme um, journey times. Um, so, so we've been we've been doing um, all of this work. We're working together with lots of partners, as you can see from from the slide pack. There's, there's lots and lots of people who've been involved. Um, and I, I might ask Susan in a moment just to speak a little bit about um, Northwest London specifically. But if I just give you an overview of what we've been doing to involve patients, um, we did quite a lot of work last year, um, have holding workshops and so on to try and understand. Um, what patients might think about those two options just at a very, very early stage. And then over the last couple of months since we've been able to uh, resume the programme following, um, uh, we, we paused it for COVID, um, we've held quite a lot of online focus groups with groups of patients from all over the, the catchment to talk to them about specific pathways like breast or prostate, to talk to them about the estates options or the clinical model, um, to, to have more of a general talk about how they feel about the review, uh, to talk about radiotherapy and, and so on. And we've been gathering feedback on those. Now, we've, we've, we've struggled somewhat with uh, this environment that we're in, that we can only send out emails. We can't go and meet people face to face and interview patients in clinics, which is what I would normally do. I haven't been able to go to patient support groups um, to sit and talk to patients, although I have actually got some appointments to have some online conversations with support groups. Um, but out of the recent activity we've done uh, and the data I've got goes up until we had an event on Saturday evening. We have had a couple of events since um, and they're not in these numbers. Um, but of the unique patients that took part, 21% um, were from Harrow. Um, and of the places that they took up, 29% of spaces at the focus groups were from people who declared that they were from Harrow. Um, another 21% didn't declare where they were from. Um, so Harrow was well represented out of the number of people that took part. Um, I will caveat that though with we are struggling to get people to engage. Um, and one of the reasons that we're being given when we talk to people about that um, as well as the sort of technical aspects of meeting together, is that this centre has been reviewed so many times and nothing's happened. They're waiting to see what the options might look like um, before getting very involved. And we, we've, we've had that message um, a fair bit. Um, so there was um, just very, very briefly from the feedback, there was widespread acceptance that things need to change. Uh, I, I, uh, and um, I, I was just pulling up some um, of the comments that I've, I've had from patients on that um, from from Harrow um, and there's some some quite interesting comments. So there was one lovely comment um, from a gentleman who said, I'm surprised we are still talking about moving from Mount Vernon. The only question is where to move it to. If there's any talk of staying there, you will not attract staff. It's self-evident it has to move to a big DGH. Get on with it. Um, and that was fairly typical of the type of feedback that we um, we got back. Um, we had a couple of people from Health Watch um, Harrow who attended a number of the um, workshops and uh, are taking part in a reference group, patient reference group that we've got to test out how well the clinical teams listen to the patient feedback. Um, as well as widespread acceptance of the case for change, there was an overwhelming preference that the whole centre should be provided on a single site rather than it being split across two sites. And this was because the, the patients that took part felt very strongly that the staff should be kept together. Um, and the, the staff have been praised consistently throughout all of the engagement work that we've done. And there was also a view that a single site would be able to have a better uh, expert level of expertise and, and um, higher levels of specialty. We talked with people about different potential site options. People from Harrow were generally willing to consider sites including Northwick Park, which you would imagine, and um, Hillingdon, uh, Watford and Luton, and potentially Harefield, although there were questions about whether they have enough of the support facilities that are required. Anything else was considered too far. Um, whilst Luton was considered by some people from Harrow to be acceptable, other people thought that that was too far. So Luton was the, the one of those that was in the border. But Watford um, was considered to be OK and obviously Hillingdon and Northwick Park um, were. 
Um, and um, they also, though, interestingly, Harrow patients were quite concerned about the lengthy travelling times of some of the other um, patients um, and felt that Northwick Park would be too far from patients from North Hertfordshire and South Bedfordshire. Um, patients, uh, are ne nearly at the end, <laughs> patients wanted to um, see whatever move we made that we looked at what we could improve locally. So there was a lot of feedback about patients having to travel to Mount Vernon for a blood test and wondered why they couldn't have their blood test locally. There was a lot of suggestions around improving that local access and improving appointment schedules and so on to make it easier to get to the specialist centre um, and, and um, be able to pick your, your time of day. Public transport links um, and patient transport uh, were also a big factor, as was car parking, as I'm sure you would imagine. Um, and IT, lots and lots of examples where the IT hasn't worked for people bet moving between hospitals and lots of examples of patients who have um, had their treatment at several different hospitals, in including one gentleman who'd had it across seven different hospitals. So we're now planning more events between January and March um, and um, lots of um, uh, different types of events, including some we're going to try and do. We don't know whether we'll be able to do them in person or not, but we're going to try and do some very geographical ones where we encourage people to only sign up if they are from that area. And obviously Harrow will be one of those areas. Um, and as I said, we've got some plans to visit cancer support groups that may have to be online um, and community groups. And I've asked Health Watch Harrow to help me with some community engagement. Um, and we're about to launch a website which will enable people to have a discussion, an ongoing discussion and answer questions and polls and all sorts of things. It's going to be much more interactive than what we have at the moment. Um, I am very concerned about the uh, everything being a bit too digital and online at the moment. So I am doing some work to try and make sure that we're hearing from people who don't have that access. Um, and that's involving some telephone conversations and um, some training and upskilling of people as well. Um, where they want to take part, but just don't have the skills at the moment. Um, just, uh, just wanted at the end, Susan, if there was anything in particular you wanted to add from a Northwest London um, ICS perspective. Thanks, Jessamy. Um, I'm Susan Sinclair, Managing Director of RM Partners, which is the Cancer Alliance that covers um, Northwest and Southwest London. Um, I'm here, and Leslie Watts um, sends her apologies this evening. Um, in terms of North West London, um, as Jeremy said, um, North West London is a fairly significant amount of the Mount Vernon work. And we're working in North West London with the East of England Programme Board to make sure that firstly, we're able to um, give the Programme Board the information they need. As you can imagine, there's a huge amount of data um, and some of that data is complex because it's chemotherapy and radiotherapy. We're also um, working to understand the options and as they emerge, really um, make sure that we understand what the impact is on Northwest London patients um, and also our other providers in Northwest London. We also want to um, make sure that as, as options emerge, we're able to respond um, so, that, so that we're quickly able to support the overall timeline and make sure that we um, work to the timelines that I think are in this, the slide pack because we understand that um, everyone's keen to deliver the, the, the solution um, in, in a way that enables us to go to consultation next year. Um, so, so in order to do that, we have representation on a, 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 a programme board that, that reports to the um, East of England board and we also have and representation on that from UCLH who are the new provider to make sure that the discussions we're having are open and transparent. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I want to add at the moment unless Ruth or Jasmine you think there's anything else I should highlight? Uh, no, I know I think that's that's fine and I think just before um, we perhaps take questions um, it's just worth highlighting that timeline and um, we are working to quite a tight timeline because things do need to change um, and that timeline takes us to what would be a public consultation in June next year is the earliest we're likely to to consult publicly. Um, and that um, uh, that that will be we will, we will need to find um, make sure that we, we know where we can get the capital for any development before we go to public consultation. So all the work we're doing with uh, patients and the public at the moment is is just working on developing the options and trying to make sure that we come up with the best options we can for consultation with a decision then being uh, made about this time next year. 
OK, I see that uh, Ruth like would like to come in because we're running out of time. So can we Thank now do you. questions and answers, please? Thank what, you. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll be really brief, but thank you, Chair. I just wanted to reinforce three points that I think Jessam has brought out during uh, the discussion. The first is there have been reviews of the services provided from the site for the last 40 years. It is really critical that we now develop um, a shared plan for reprovision. And I think I won't repeat the case uh, that Jessam has talked through, but I did want to make that point. Um, the second point is one I'm sure that you would ask about. Uh, which is about the capital resources. We are still looking for capital resources to deliver a reprovision. So that's that's really important. Those discussions are ongoing. We have not accessed that capital resource as yet. And, and the third point I wanted to make again re reinforces something that Jessamy said, which is about the staff. So throughout all of the staff engagement and the patient engagement, reproviding the services and keeping a coherent, sustainable workforce really relies on us developing jointly with you um, a sustainable plan for the reprovision of the services. I'll pause there, Chair, um, because I know you've got people that will want to ask questions, but I just wanted to reinforce those particular issues. Thanks very Thanks. much. Could I invite Vina Mitani to ask question, please? Sorry. <clears throat> uh, thank you for such a comprehensive uh, outline of the uh, Mount Vernon Cancer Centre. My question is, uh, you said you did uh, workshops. Uh, what uh, age group uh, did you include? Um, we left it very open for people to participate, um, but um, I would say that the majority of the people if, um, were over 50. Um, there was a wide range of people and there were some people quite considerably over 50 that were using the technology and we did provide quite a lot of support. We did a couple of training sessions for people um, to enable them to use the technology um, to get involved as well. Um, but yeah, we have not managed to engage younger people at the moment. Um, that is one of the um, the areas that I'm trying to work with some local health watch organisations and local um, community groups to try and see how we can improve that. It, it's not unsurprising given that cancer prevalence is higher in older people. Um, and, but then, and some of the people that were taking part, they were talking about the experiences of their parents um, who they've been the carer for. Uh, can I just uh, have a follow on? Mm -hmm. uh, you say the young people were uh, not included because a uh, majority of the people are elderly uh, people who normally get it. Uh, but have you got data of how many uh, young people have been using Mount Vernon? I mean, I don't we don't need it now, but if you can uh, send it to us, that will be quite helpful. Yeah. And have you decided on any locations or uh, anticipation uh, where the centre will be located. OK, so, so very, sh shall uh, I come back on, on, on both of those? So in terms of um, the uh, uh, age of the population, we, we can have a look and see what we can get you. We certainly have cancer prevalence data um, by age. The, the Mount Vernon service is only an adult service. So when I'm talking about younger people, I'm talking about adults. I'm not talking about children. It doesn't provide paediatric Care. Um, in terms of sites, we are going through a process at the moment. So we felt it was the right thing to do to look at every hospital within the catchment area being a potential site um, and doing some work around what that would mean for access. Now, as you would imagine, some of those sites are right at the edge of the catchment area and will be far too far for patients from the other end. Um, and so we will go through an exercise in December. Um, where we will shortlist down to a small number and that will be based on criteria that um, the patients helped us select last year um, and that's around are they is the site able to deliver the the clinical support that's needed to provide safe high quality services and is it going to be easy enough to access uh, and those those will be a way of just narrowing it down so that we'll have a small number of options to do a lot more detailed work with, particularly around um, public uh, transport. We, we started to do some of that, but we need to do an awful lot more around access and the, the different potential options. 
But just as uh, people from Harrow have said, they would really only like to see considered Northwick Park, Hillingdon, Harefield, Luton and Watford. I would be very surprised if after we've gone through that process, any of the wider ones are left in, in, in um, they're, they're just too far for people. So if you th if you think about it, Stoke Mandeville is in the um, uh, catchment, but that would be too far from people from the east of the catchment. Bedford is in the catchment, but that would be too far from people for northwest London. So we're, we're going through the process properly. We will do a proper evaluation and come up with a shortlist. My my guess um, is that it will be uh, out of those five that we've talked about tonight. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Can I invite uh, Natasha Proctor, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, my question sort of touches on the question that um, Councilor Massani just asked and also what you suggested to me, Andrew Ruth. Um, I wanted to kind of ask, we know that Watford General has had recently secured a lot of funding for capital for redevelopment. Is that something, seeing as you said, Ruth, we struggle to get capital in for the development at Mount Vernon and also, as you said, a lot of Harry residents selected Watford as a preferable choice. With the fact that that's a site at the moment that is looking to undergo a bit of a transformation, would that have any bearing on the consultation or would it be a purely based on kind of the decisions that people tell you about? So I just wondered if that would have um, an impact. Yes, shall I pick that one up? So we're, we've had exploratory conversations with each of the trusts in the area who've got capital development. So uh, there's capital development uh, plans in place in Luton, uh, in Watford and in Hillingdon. So, so with each of the trusts, we're having those conversations. Clearly, it may be for us um, a positive route to capital where there's an ongoing, as you've just pointed out, where there's an ongoing development in place. Um, there are processes that we need to go through um, in order to, and it's not straightforward, I understand, to add in a sizable additional requirement into those schemes because they've already been announced. So, that, so there's quite a lot of work that we need to do around that. But we are in discussions with each of the trusts so that by the time we come to a shortlist of the potential acute sites, um, clearly we need to understand that we can't be shortlisting a trust to whom that is a surprise. They will have agreed prior to uh, to the, the meeting that we have in the middle of December. Uh, yeah, could I just add on to that, that I think um, the, the shortlisting that we'll be doing in December won't be looking specifically at uh, whether we can add, whether they've got a building site, it will be purely around access and whether they've got the clinical facilities. There'll be another lot of work then done on that shortlist before the actual options will be selected and that will be around March or April time. And one of those options that, that in, if you go into the detail criteria that patients are really keen to see is it's got to be doable. And part of that will be around those kind of opportunities. So I think that will become more of a factor as we move through into the next few months. Mm. Okay. Thank you both for your answers. Thank you. Can I invite Michael Borio, please? Councillor Borio. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for the, um, I think that was a really useful update that you've given us. Um, once the final decision has been taken on the new location for the Cancer Centre following public consultation, what will that mean for the actual future, though, of the hospital itself at Mount Vernon? Thank you. So, shall I pick this one up? So, we're working uh, with Hillingdon. So, Hillingdon have clearly developing all their um, estates plans for the Hillingdon site and also for the Mount Vernon site. So to make sure that we're all joined up, we also sit on their planning group. So um, I think we would need to come back and perhaps we could do this if, if you invite us back to your um, committee at a future date uh, with Hillingdon Trust at the same time to talk about their potential plans for the site. It might be a little bit easy to do that once their plans are a little bit more developed and we've got further uh, information about our proposals as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. OK, what I would like to say is there are a few questions. Can we send them to you because time is running out? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you very much. I would like to thank the NHS England and NHS Improvement representatives for their time. You're more than welcome to remain on this call for the re remainder of the meeting. I appreciate you might have had a long, long day, so <laughs> do feel free to leave if you prefer. 
The meeting will be recorded and will be available on the council website for you to watch if you wish. So thanks again. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you very much, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Your report has been Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. OK, we move on to next item. Item nine, progress on out of hospital plan. Would Paul Hewitt, Corporate Director of People, introduce the presentation, please? OK, I think we may have missed an item, but anyway, we'll go with this one. So um, just uh, as a reminder, um, the out of hospital plan was agreed I and beg discussed. I your pardon, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Paul. Can we go back? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, right. that's fine, Councillor. I was in midstream, but we'll have to wait for that. Yes, so you, okay, sorry. We will move the item other way around. Sorry. Okay, come back, Paul. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Which, uh, sorry, which item back. do you want me to do, Councillor? Out of hospital plan since you okay. started. Sorry. Let's do it. Let's do it. Sorry. So um, just as a reminder for everyone on the call, we did um, have the out of hospital plan um, discussed at a previous scrutiny in July, and it did go to the health, health and wellbeing board. Very important for the integrated care partnership here in Harrow that uh, it's the vehicle for responding to COVID and for moving towards better integration of all our care pathways. So that work has been progressing and tonight we're going to uh, invite Javina and Genevieve to present some of the updates from that important piece of work. Thank you. So hopefully Javina can come on. Javina. I am on. Thank you very much. I am on. Um, okay, thank I'm, you. I'm on and so is Genevieve. And we're thank just you. waiting for Ayo to share the slides on the screen. Um, may I ask the IT team officers please to share the slides on the uh, progress on out of hospital plan? Thank you. Next slide, please. And next one, thank you. Yes, it starts from here, thank you. Thank you. I think Genevieve is going to talk us through a couple of slides. I'm um, indeed, uh, thank you very much and evening everybody. Um, so um, if I could just take the next slide, please. Um, we just wanted to give you a little bit of context around what's going on at at the moment. Um, as I'm sure you are all aware, um, we have been um, on a, dare I say, a journey over recent uh, years, and this has been particularly accelerated over the course of the last few months um, during COVID to um, to really kind of work much more cohesively together. That's something that we've seen very much together in Harrow, but it's also something that's happening across Northwest London as the uh, different trusts that have responded to COVID and have been working successfully within Northwest London have been um, working uh, collectively together, but also in the work that we're doing to become one CCG um, as part of the whole integrated care system or ICS for short. So um, in uh, we have now received agreement from all of the eight different part CCG member practices that they have uh, agreement for us to go forward to become one CCG um, and we are just going forward with our application for that uh, at Northwest, at uh, NHS England uh, level. Perhaps probably best if we go on to the next slide. Um, and, um, and what we are doing now is uh, going through the process of that. So come April 21, 2021, um, we will be one CCG, um, but we will still absolutely at the heart of that 
have very much a local presence in Harrow and that is what's so important because we know that if we really want to deliver local care for our residents we need to ensure that we do that at the place and that place is Harrow. So whilst we have a uh, a broad collection of work that goes on at uh, at Northwest London level, uh, we still very much are centred on the delivery of care in Harrow. We're very fortunate in Harrow because um, the leader uh, of the council um, supports the partnership board um, at a Northwest London level and the Harrow Council Chief Exec, uh, Sean Harris, is very involved in also uh, the Northwest London work and so we actually get the opportunity to um, to be part of the Northwest London work and get that information from an early stage. And I'm fortunate to join Sean in a number of those meetings. So as we progress on, we need to think about how we have a Northwest London integrated care system and a Harrow partnership. And in Harrow, we have come, and I think this, we, we've come to talk to you th about this before, but we've come together as a health and care partnership and that's, uh, that's delivering um, some really cha uh, tangible changes and we'll go on to tell you a little bit more about that in the future, in the, in the forthcoming slides. But, um, but if I move you on to the next slide, as we um, have those conversations, we need to think about our relationships. And so um, this slide is really kind of like articulating how relationships will work at a borough level. We know we've got uh, strong local authority representation. We've got uh, fantastic primary lead representation. We've got five primary care networks um, and the primary care network clinical directors are coming together as part of the um, health and care uh, partnership and executive um, and we also have community services through our, our work with um, CLCH and mental health as you know from CNWL. But as we come together we need to make sure that that quartet as it's being called um, really starts to collectively work to deliver change at one place in Harrow and we are working together to work out how that will actually work in the nuts and bolts of it but what is fantastic to see is the amount of buy-in and input we are getting from from everybody in this. One of the biggest agendas for us as a health and care partnership is the work that we must do as part of the inequalities agenda. So if I could just have the next slide. Um, as you know, inequalities have been demonstrated um, by uh, a lot of um, the tragedy that's happened in the COVID era. But actually, COVID has only demonstrated inequalities that we know have been there for some considerable time. And we need to now um, put uh, additional energy um, and focus into addressing those health inequalities. So uh, there's a number of streams that are going on, but as you will see, this is very much a partnership enterprise across Northwest London with health and local authority together. Um, and you will see that in the representation of the three groups that are articulated down the bottom here. We've got population health, which is uh, pulled together by Directors of Public Health together with MC Patel, who's Chair of Brent CCG. Then we have the, um, the Economic Regeneration Group because we know that's absolutely essential. Um, uh, you know, economic well-being is so intrinsically linked, as you know, to quality of life and quality of outcomes. And then we've got the uh, System Delivery and Accountability Group. So, so we've got some really firm structures that are coming together. We're very, very excited and passionate about how we can really start to, to address some of those health inequalities. But we know we cannot do this in isolation. This is definitely not uh, health in one part, local authority in the other. This is really about how we deliver that service collectively together with our residents, with our, our voluntary sectors and with the people of Harrow. So, Lots of work to do, but I'm going to hand over to Io, who's going to take you some, through some of the more specific 
instances that are going on in Harrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aya Dekoya. I'm um, the program manager for integrated care in Harrow, and I help to facilitate the implementation of the out of hospital recovery plan. Um, could you um, move to the next slide, please? Thank you. And the next one. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so this slide just shows the planning process that we've been working on um, through since the development of the out of hospital recovery plan in June. Um, so we now have 11 work streams and two subgroups on the programme. Um, with each of the work streams, we've identified senior responsible officers, management leads. Um, we've got CCG clinical leads, um, PCN CDs as well, clinical directors. Um, and the work streams all have members from the various organisations across the partnership. So that's healthcare, social care uh, and the voluntary. Sorry, can't hear. Hi, you're on mute. No, you're yeah, back. Unmute. Unmuted. Yep. Did you not hear anything? I'm so sorry about that. We did <laughs> lose the first part, first part. But we, we lost you halfway through. Oh, you did. OK, so all right, I, we, we've got 11 work streams and two subgroups on the program and um, within each of the work streams, we've identified um, management leads, clinical leads, senior responsible officers, um, and we've also got um, members from various organisations across the partnership sitting within each of those work streams. So that's um, social care, <clears throat> health care and the voluntary sector. Um, so, so we're working in collaboration and um, th this is real partnership working that we are, um, that's the approach that we're taking within each of these work streams. We've got terms of reference um, for each of the work streams and we've developed something called um, logic modules for each of the clinical um, work streams and basically the logic model is just a tool that helps us to match the aims of the work stream with all the activities that are required in order to meet the aims and of course the outcomes that we want to or we're expecting from the work we're doing um, and going through that pro the, the process that you can see um, um, on the slide has actually helped us to see what we've got in place across health and social care for each of the areas that we've identified. And it's meant that we've started to streamline our activity um, and begin to remove duplication. Um, and it's also allowed us to see where there are gaps in the resources or in, in pathways um, and to join join the dots where, where, there, ha where there are gaps. Um, it's helped us to connect people in ways that we were never able to before. So we are now in a position where developing implementation plans and cases for change where um, they are required, where we've identified gaps and we can see that there's transformation work to be done or, or improvements to, to pathways. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Thank you. So the next slide or this slide just just lists each of the work streams and just highlights the latest updates we have on each one. Um, there are eight clinical work streams and three enablers um, and then there are two subgroups as well. So there's one on safeguarding and one on carers. Um, we have a Harrow Health and Care Executive that meets each Friday morning and the senior responsible officers from the work streams highlight any issues or blockers um, for resolution or for discussion. Um, the work streams meet regularly, they meet uh, fortnightly, some of them, and some of them meet monthly. Um, and there are some key lenses from which we're viewing all this work. So one is communication and engagement, and, and that's both staff engagement and community engagement. Um, another focus, as Genevieve has alluded to, is tackling the inequalities in our population. So there's a lot of work around that, gathering information and data, which is helping us to understand how then we can engage with um, our communities in the right way so that um, we actually are able to um, co-produce some of what we need to do with them. Um, and then we're working very hard as well to support staff across the partnership in their well-being at this time. Um, and of course, all this is being done through the lens of our, our COVID response. Um, 
so so that's it really those are the two slides i wanted to present and just give you an overview of the work that we've done and, and the updates of where we are with it thank you thank you are there any questions and comments on the presentation councillor natasha thank you chair um I just want to raise one point that was kind of written on the side of one of yours, Genevieve, and also at the end for you as well, Aya. I'm just talking about one inclusion and also digital transformation. Um, so it's kind of like a two pronged thing, really. It's kind of how are we making sure that we're maximising digital opportunities and bringing that to make things easier for people to do from home and not having to go to the doctor but at the same time, making sure people don't get excluded from this as well, because I know not everybody has access, but yeah, so a bit of a tricky one. So if I perhaps start uh, start this and then I maybe can give some specifics of things that we are doing. But basically, um, you're absolutely right um, that, that digital access in itself can be an inequality at the moment because uh, we have got a, a population of people who have had to learn very fast, as we all have, let's be honest, um, how to do things um, in a remote way. And that doesn't fit. So it's really important that we maximise the opportunities for people to be involved in a digital way so that we can also devote time to see people and be face to face with people where it is a barrier. And of course, some of that will be, um, uh, you know, language barriers, but particularly our deaf community. It will be people who are perhaps um, older or we know that it's quite interesting when we look at our population who have got who are in the um, the autistic spectrum disorder for some of those people actually going digital has been a fantastic enabler because it's worked very well with the way that they think but it actually hasn't been the case for all of them so as is always the case with with um, interventions to do with people, you've got to be bespoke in the way that you do it. But I think that we're learning a lot about these barriers. We're learning a lot about these these um, different um, ways that we can overcome them. But what is clear is you can never have a one size fits all approach because people aren't like that. I, uh, do you want to pick up any of the specifics? I think you said it all actually Genevieve and, and we're working with Northwest London, uh, the team in Northwest London at the moment um, to, to understand how we can actually help um, our communities where there might be digital exclusion because of access or, or for whatever reasons um, in, in understanding what those could be and therefore what kind of interventions can we put as alternatives to support that. So that work is ongoing as well. Thank you. That's all really reassuring to hear. Thank you very much for those answers. Come to Lavina Mitrani. Thank you for a brief uh, presentation. My uh, sort of uh, concern is, I know we are all uh, becoming one uh, CCG. How is the budget working and how will um, the Harrow patients, especially GP patients, uh, will benefit? And I know um, sometimes uh, not all the sort of uh, services are being met because uh, I always hear that there is a budget cut. And also at the moment, because of COVID, uh, not many GPs are um, uh, seeing patients face to face. And we have some group, we are not uh, digitally comfortable or they may not have computer access. So how are we going to be looking after uh, those who are uh, not comfortable with uh, IT or digital and the budgeting? And how are we going to look after our uh, patients uh, in Harrow? So if I uh, could have those two answers, please, either uh, Genevieve or, or whoever can uh, take the um, questions. Sure, I'm happy to, to try and attempt to answer those and you can come back to me if I don't cover all of your points, Councillor McCartney. Um, so maybe I'll just start with the GP answer first, as that's also my day job sometimes. Um, the um, so, so it's really, um, it is absolutely clear, every one of the 33 GP practices in Harrow is open. 
and every one of the 33 practices in Harrow are seeing patients face to face. What we are doing is using, as I was just explaining to Councillor Proctor, we're using the, um, the provision of services to people who need to be seen face to face in the right way so that we've got capacity to do that. Because obviously in this COVID era, infection control is absolutely paramount and we want to make sure that we're seeing people in a way that is COVID safe and secure. And so um, it makes the, the throughput of people um, going through the surgery uh, kind of like a little bit slower. Having said that, we are doing a fantastic flu campaign in, in Harrow. We've, we've vaccinated thousands and thousands of people through our surgeries in Harrow um, over the last month, and they are coming into our practices in a way that is COVID safe and getting their flu jab. So, so it's entirely possible to be seen, but we're not um, seeing everybody. Uh, we are making judgments. We're having telephone conversations. We're doing video consultations. Um, but as I said to Councillor Proctor, if there are barriers to access, and I see this all the time in my own practice, you know, sometimes it's just easier to see people and those people absolutely should be seen. Other people are actually quite happy with the fact that they're actually having what they consider to be a more accessible service because it's a bit more adaptable to their own way of life. So it's a bit of courses and courses, to be honest with you. But but I, I would, you know, if you're feeling or you're hearing from your, your residents that they feel that general practice is not open, then absolutely do let them know and let the CCG know if you're feeling that, because that's something that we can absolutely address with the practices, because nobody should feel that general practice is not open. So come to your second question. <coughs> yeah, which thank is you. The money. Well, that was actually your first question. Um, so so the, um, the situation of, um, of financing in Northwest London is quite interesting. I'll try not to get over uh, involved. During COVID, what's happened in the second half of the year of COVID is that, um, is that the NHS England has decided to give to Northwest London the, the money that uh, they would normally give to all of the individual CCGs and trusts. They've given it to us en masse and they've said, basically, you're all working together very collectively as a system, get on with managing the money as a system. So we are actually... Um, basically um, allocating the money out to the different parts of Northwest London as they work. So we're getting some really good feel of how the money flows are working during this part of the second half of this COVID year. As we move into one CCG following April 21, we will see um, the, the money allocations come to, down to Northwest London in exactly the same way. Now, obviously, there are budget lines that have been set for some time, and those budget lines will need to be absolutely on it. So one of the main precepts of coming together as one CCG was to try and make an offer to the residents of Northwest London that is consistent. So what we're trying to aim for is we're trying to aim for a situation where the service that you get in Harrow is the same as the service you get in Hounslow or Westminster. And to do that, we've got to level up to, uh, to make sure that where there are services that we have that others don't, they need to get those and where and vice versa. This will take some time and we know that it's going to probably take us four or five years, disappointingly, um, to get to a point where we will have leveled up uh, on the money side of things. But what's really important is we hold ourselves to account that we spend the money wisely, that it's spent to the best objectives of what we want to do as one CCG. But we will um, we are very hopeful that we will get to a point where we can be really proud of a consistent offer of care across northwest London. So that's a quite brief answer to quite a complicated question. I hope it was useful. Oh, OK, one point about the flu vaccine you were saying Harrow is doing well. I'm sorry to say I've had quite a few complaints because a couple of surgeries did not have enough stock and they say go to the local pharmacy and the local pharmacy did not have stock and this was in October. And I think this is not really acceptable. 
when uh, uh, you know it's uh, if uh, there's a delay in flu vaccine. So I'm not sure how many people have been vaccinated and if we have enough uh, stock in uh, various surgeries where they, they didn't have stock initially in October. So I'm conscious we've got five minutes left and this is quite a, a difficult answer. So very happy to talk to you another time, Councillor Vidlani. But basically the latest figures are that we've vaccinated 67% of our over 65s, which is better than we've ever done before. And we've vaccinated about 35% of our up risk groups under 65s, which is also good. But you're absolutely right. Stock supplies were quite slow in coming in. And that's because um, practices were not able to order the stock because the government decided to kind of hold it back more centrally. So, so it was, it was, we actually order our flu vaccines about a year ahead. And of course, nobody thought of COVID when we were ordering those flu vaccines. So it has been not the quickest supply. My own practice was stuck on 32% forever for the under 65s. And then last weekend, we got our flu stocks in and we did 200 people like that. So we're trying to match it, but you're right. It is a bit clunky in places, but I'm still very proud of what GP practices are doing. Thank you for uh, your answers. <clears throat> Can I invite Councillor Lewinson, please? Just a very quick question to you, Genevieve. What was the main priority um, for the money you were talking about? What's the main priority? To what, what, to was the main, what was one of the main priorities? Well, I think that it's clear that there are two main priorities this year. There's making sure that we we manage COVID well, and there's making sure that we we manage uh, the non-COVID priorities well as well. So so you know it's really important that we don't just think about COVID. We think about cancer and 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 screening programs and public health programs and all of those things. I mean you know we can't just constantly have a blinkered approach to COVID. We have to make sure we look after the whole of people's uh, health and conditions. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, we can get you detail on that if you want. OK, thank you. There's one more hand up, but it just says plus four, so I don't know who is it. Who, who would like to ask Christine. Question? It's me, I put my hand up. Sorry, hello. Hi. Hi, Rekha. Is it all right? Hi, you Christine. Can you please go ask questions? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, just yeah. to say hello, Javina. Hello, Io. Hello, Genevieve. Um, I want to thank you um, for for this really interesting piece of information that you brought. I'm very glad to know things are moving along as much as they are and want to thank you because I know you've done such a lot of work. Um, I just wanted to ask and maybe you can't tell me now. You could just tell me later. Maybe it will pop up at the Health and Wellbeing Board. But on the um, on the work stream slide where it mentions that there were six recommendations that came out of the work stream for children and young people, I was wondering what they were. So it sounds as though we're running out of time now here, but it, I, I really would just like to know. So get it to me some other way if there isn't time tonight. OK. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Same year. I have a question, but I think I'll, I'll have to send it to you because we are totally running out of time. So uh, let me. Uh, can the subcommittee note the update? Agreed. <coughs> Agreed. Before we move on to next item, I would like to note that this is the last meeting for Javina Segal as she changes role and we'll be moving on from Hero CCG. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank Javina for her time and expertise and wish her all the best in, the, in her future endeavors. I would also like to welcome the new Chief Executive Officer for Hero, Brent and Hillingdon, Sheikh Alauddin, who will be joining our meeting in Javina's place. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Look you, forward to it. OK, thank you, Javina. Thank you, Javina. <laughs> All the best. Thank you very much. That's very, very kind and thank gracious. Thanks very much thank for you, coming. Chancellor. Thank you. Thank we'll you for everything. You'll OK, now we can go back to item eight.
response to COVID update. Wood Carol Furlong, Director of Public Health, present the latest position for COVID-19 in the borough, please. Uh, yep, here we go. Um, I'll try and be as uh, Sorry, quick Carol. as <laughs> Try and be <laughs> as quick as I can. Um, Hopefully it's, this is going to load. Can people see this? Yes? Yes. Yeah, that's great. OK, so um, the first slide, um, there we are, the dashboard shows where, where we are at the moment. Um, and it shows that we um, uh, have got an increasing rate. Um, uh, when I did the slides, um, which was two nights ago, it was 182.8. As of uh, this evening, it's 192.3, so it's still rising. And the rate in uh, over 60s is quite worrying because that's rising at quite a, quite a quick rate at the moment. Um, uh, we've got a, a, an increase of about 45% over the past seven days, and the rate now is 151.3. Um, so that, that is, is quite quite a, a worrying trend because that's the group that we are um, uh, most concerned about because they're, they're most affected by, by COVID and we're in, in the first wave. Um, our number of cases that we've had in the last seven days, um, on seven days to the 13th, um, uh, is 483. So that is also an increase um, uh, on the, the, the slide that I put together. Um, so this just, this just shows you a bit more about uh, the cases and shows you, um, you know, the, the this upward trend. Um, if we look at the patterns of COVID, um, we can see that um, on the first slide, the orange and yellow patterns, um, the, the darker the colour, the higher the rate. Um, so the bottom band is uh, under 16, so then it's 16 to 29, um, 30 to 45, 45 to 64 and over 64 and um, we can see that the, the uh, younger adults um, uh, uh, are actually uh, have the highest rates um, children have the lowest rates um, uh, but you can see that it's heating up in, in all of these groups um, if we think about it in terms of patterns across the, the, uh, the local authority um, we can't see patterns in the local authority. Every week, when we were, you know, we're mapping um, the the data, you know, a, a few times a week, we look at we look at it, and there's no distinct pattern. It's not happening in one place. It's happening across the board, um, and uh, so we have concerns that you know it's it it's not one area that we can target. Um, which is a pity because it would be a lot easier to target one area than target the whole of the, the local authority. In terms of ethnicity, um, the only group that we're seeing uh, overrepresented is the other ethnic group and the white group is underrepresented. Um, so the other ethnic group would include um, people from uh, Southeast Asia, like, um, Thailand, Vietnam, um, Japan, China um, uh, and uh, also people from the Middle East probably um, identify themselves in there. Um, on the graph, um, the, the bottom row uh, is uh, Black, African and Caribbean, uh, then Indian, Pakistani, uh, um, Indian other and then white, mixed race and then um, the other um, at the top, just in case you can't read it because it's quite small. Um, uh, we did have a change in data. I, I won't go on to that one. It made a very small difference um, and it was due to um, students uh, who had given, two, uh, had given one address and then NHS picked up their GP records and gave us the GP records. Um, throughout, throughout the pandemic, we've seen people um, dying from COVID. We've had 420, um, 412 deaths rather um, to the end of October um, from COVID and the majority of them happened in uh, between March and early June. Um, but 
the deaths have never stopped completely. We've we've always had um, uh, sporadic numbers, um, single single cases, some some weeks. Um, but over the uh, the month of October, um, we had deaths every week, um, and uh, you know, the concern is that that's that's now on the increase as well. Um, with testing, we've got uh, our mobile testing unit twice a week at, um, at the Civic Centre. Uh, we've got a, a unit that goes to Northwick Park three weeks out, three weekends out of four. Um, we have a local testing centre in South Harrow um, and they're now working at full capacity. So we're seeing much, uh, increasing numbers of people being tested and we're developing uh, two further sites in the borough, which we're waiting to hear from Department of Health about which ones they uh, they're going to approve. They're going to do their site survey on Tuesday, apparently. Um, we're doing testing in care homes uh, and there is a, an issue about sometimes about getting the results and we keep escalating this. Um, uh, it seem, it that again seems a bit sporadic about when it happens. Um, the most exciting things I think about testing um, uh, yeah, I'm very sad I get excited about things like testing, um, <laughs> uh, is the lateral flow devices um, which are um, going to be rolled out across the country. Um, it's the sort of thing that's been used in Liverpool um, and uh, it works a little bit like a pregnancy test. So it will give a result within 30 minutes. So instead of having to wait a couple of days for your result, you'll get, the, get it very quickly. Um, and then there's a, a equally quick um, result that's going to be an uh, equally quick test that's going to be rolled out um, uh, across the hospitals for NHS staff as well. Um, we'll give you more information about testing um, when we have it, um, but uh, I won't go into any more detail tonight. Um, we've been doing lots of stuff around awareness raising with different uh, communities. We've produced um, multilingual information, um, some of it local, some of it pan London, um, uh, all of which um, is better than uh, the, uh, the government have produced. I think um, their the, the, their languages are very uh, a, a very small number, um, and uh, London is very diverse. And so even when we've produced sixty languages, it still doesn't cover all of the languages that we would like to have in London. Um, and um, as I said, we produce some, some really nice videos um, with different communities and we developed a script that we have circulated around lots of different communities so that they can do their own uh, video just on their um, uh, their smartphones um, and send that round to, to people in, the, in their communities. And we're working with uh, Westminster University and the Young Harrow Foundation uh, to target those young adults um, that uh, have got the highest rates um, and you know coming up to Christmas um, we're trying to do some videos that will encourage them uh, not to go out and uh, mix too much when lockdown finishes. Um, contact tracing, we're doing local contact tracing now in Harrow and um, uh, we get the results uh, that we get the, the people that the NHS test and trace haven't been able to contact um, uh, in the uh, first day and a half uh, after they, they've uh, got their results. Um, we then contact, spend the next 24 hours trying to contact them. We try them a number of times uh, and we then, um, depending on what information we've got, we will then um, uh, we leave messages on their phone, we'll send an email or take a letter around to their address um, and uh, we're completing um, a, a num uh, quite a number of them. Uh, the biggest problem that we have with, with that is the, the information that people are, are giving um, not being adequate. So there's a, a quite a high proportion where we uh, the, the phone number um, never gets answered or the um, and the address is incomplete. They've not given them a, a, an email address. So so that that is our, our biggest bugbear at the moment. Um, and we're, we're looking at different techniques of trying to try and contact people. But um, 
and part of that is about reminding people that they will be contacted by NHS Test and Trace when they have their, their test um, originally, rather than uh, 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 trying to, to come at them afterwards. Um, uh, and if anybody uh, is affected by uh, COVID, we've got personal isolation payments for people who are on low income and that will enable them to stay home um, without worrying about um, being able to afford to pay bills. Um, and But we do have uh, a few issues over people being asked by their um, employer uh, to, to isolate without the, all their details uh, going onto the test and trace system. So they, um, they, they uh, don't have a number um, which is what we're supposed to validate. Um, so that is that is a slight problem at the moment, but um, that again, that would be that's resolvable. Um, and then we have business grants for businesses that have been affected by lockdown as well. And um, uh, Fernsill Warriors team is leading on that. Um, of the final thing I just wanted to mention was about the vaccination programme. So delivery of the vaccination programme is being led by the NHS and uh, we're working with uh, the CCG on identifying the mass vaccination sites across the borough. Um, I've put probably four to six sites, I think it's four sites. Um, uh, so there'll be one large site and then three sites covering uh, the five PCNs. Um, and we're expecting that the first lot of vaccine um, subject to it being approved by the um, MHRA will be uh, available from uh, mid-December and the first group that will be um, vaccinated will be people who live in care homes um, and then there's a, a priority framework for, for vaccination so it won't be going out for um, to uh, a general public until quite quite a lot um, a lot later um, but the the numbers that are are being um, proposed for doing for doing this um, uh, vaccination program are huge. And uh, as Genevieve said, the PCNs have and the practices have uh, done an amazing job with the flu uh, program, and I expect that we'll do an equally amazing job um, uh, with this COVID vaccination program. And I'm going to finish there, I think. Um, and pass over to Angela um, to cover the um, adult social care winter plan. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Carol. So um, I'll be fairly brief um, with this element of it. So uh, as the title says, it's the adult social care winter plan um, and that's the Department of Health and Social Care published a national um, adult social care winter plan in, in September. It sets out um, the support and expectations for each local authority, NHS organisation and care provider. And every local authority has to ensure they have a winter plan in place, which we do have in Europe. Um, we've completed ours in coordination with our partner agencies and it's incorporated, incorporated the recommendations that are required. Sorry, Carol, would you be able to do the, the next slide? Um, and just to, to say a little bit about what that covers. Um, so clearly, really importantly, um, with the current climate infection um, uh, control and prevention, um, seasonal flu vaccinations, um, making sure that health and, and care services jointly work, um, particularly including our discharge planning from the hospital, um, supporting people who receive social care and very importantly, their carers, supporting the care workforce, um, obviously, that's our own um, workforce, but also our um, uh, carers who work in, in provider services, whether that be in residential homes or domiciliary care or um, uh, personal carers. Um, ensuring that the care market, um, so our, the providers that we work with um, are getting support and that we ensure that there's sustainability um, for our providers so that our citizens have that local choice and making sure that there's um, local and uh, oversight and support. And as I say, that plan is, is shared and worked with, um, with our key partners and that's reviewed regularly and particularly at the moment with um, uh, COVID, uh, even more so I'd say. 
Carol, is it? Thank you. Um, so that we, there is a, a nationwide um, review um, being carried out by DHSC, um, and that's looking at um, the risk to continuity in the care market at the moment, um, contingency plans in place to mitigate those risks, and the um, local needs for support via the regional arrangements. Um, so we, we have in Harrow taken part in that review and submitted key information to present the local views. Um, and the key messages for us is that um, we're looking to make sure that uh, there are any identified risks in the market that needs uh, ongoing support and funding that we're able to make sure that we're able to put that forward um, by continually looking at our infection control. Uh, we work, work very, very closely with our partners at the CCG um, and our, the PCNs. Um, in how we support our, um, our providers and our homes um, and, and that work goes very much across what clinical support um, the homes require and our providers but also um, what social care support we need to give as well and that that's a very brief summary of the adult social care uh, winter plan thank you Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, I have a question. OK, go on, Vina. I'm uh, sorry, I don't know what's happened. My video is gone now. Uh, my question is to Carol. Thank you, uh, and Angela. Very good presentation. Um, uh, how uh, reliable is this uh, rapid uh, kit you were talking about? And uh, are the results reliable? And my second question uh, uh, quickly, uh, what, why is the young people numbers rising? What are we doing uh, to sort of uh, spread the message? Because this is very worrying because the trend is not coming down. Um, Thank you. Right. OK, uh, the, the um, lateral flow devices um, are um, very sensitive and um, we, they will pick up about 95% um, of cases. So we're quite confident that, that they are um, a, a good alternative to the uh, PCR tests. Um, there, uh, there, there are occasional batch problems with them, um, as with any test, and there's issues around training people to do them properly. Um, and so that's got to be part of our strategy um, uh, with, uh, with, with when we're rolling it out. Um, so you know, we're, we're looking at that and about how we train, we train people to read them. Um, but, but essentially, if you can read a pregnancy test, you can read a lateral flow uh, COVID test. Um, so it's, it's not that difficult. Um, I, and I think with, with young people, we've had we had issues with um, uh, younger people going back to university and college and uh, obviously not mixing, uh, not um, staying socially distanced and, uh, you know, the, the mixes at the beginning of term um, and that caused um, nationally, it caused it caused um, a big rise in numbers. Um, but we've also got a lot of young people who work in face-to-face uh, -face industries and also, you know, they uh, being young people, they they think they're invulnerable and that this is not a problem for them. Um, so the messages that we've got to get across to them is that they are taking it home and they're infecting uh, their older relatives. Um, the majority of house uh, of spread in Harrow is household spread. So once somebody gets it in a household, if a household is mixing with another household, then that that's how that's how it's spreading. We're not we're not seeing workplace outbreaks in any significant numbers or associated with uh, cafes or anything like that. It's it's nearly all as house household spread. Um, so so that you know that's the that's the message. Don't mix households. Don't go and visit your your friends even though we all really want to. Um, so, um, Natasha. You've got your hand up as well. No, That's okay, Chair. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, um, my question was going to be about with the rapid testing. I know that it was rolled out to, I can't remember how many boroughs, about 20 of them to test that out to start with and Harrow wasn't one of them. I wondered if there was a reason that Harrow wasn't included. Um, and my other question is about the numbers we're seeing now. Do we have an idea of what percentage of them are asymptomatic? And if there's any idea kind of how many numbers, if there was more testing available in the first wave, if it would be comparative or if we think there's more this time, less last time, or if it hasn't really changed. Sorry, that's a really difficult question as well, but <laughs> that's a really difficult question. Um, I think because we weren't doing testing, we, we really have no idea about how many people actually had COVID um, uh, in, in that first wave. Um, what we do know is that um, the, the testing that's been done in the REACT study, which is um, testing antibodies, um, has, has been sort of giving us hints about how many people. And the other the other studies that we've, we've had is asymptomatic testing by uh, ONS, and we've had um, blood donor testing, um, so they, they test all samples, um, looking for the, the antibody levels again in, in that one. And then the symptomatic um, trackers, um, by uh, uh, London School of Hygiene and by King's College. Um, you've probably heard of that, the ZOE um, project. Um, so we look at all of those different things to estimate what the what the impact of, um, uh, of COVID has been. Um, I think at the end of the, um, towards the end of the summer, the estimate was that something like 17% of people in London um, had had COVID, um, uh, but, since they've been redoing the, the those uh, antibody testing, that number has been coming down because the antibody levels wane. Um, so it's a, it is a really complicated um, uh, pattern. I can't tell you how many people are asymptomatic, um, uh, um, asymptomatically tested, um, but we are getting um, uh, people who are tested asymptomatically who work in care homes. Um, and work in health um, are, are, are proving positive. Um, uh, they, they're not very high in number, but you know, um, it, it is happening. And that's one of the reasons why we want to do this asymptomatic rapid flow testing so that we can actually pick out some, uh, some of those um, uh, asymptomatic things. So an example would be, um, I'm, which I think is gonna be the easiest one for us to implement, um, is is doing teachers and mm. and and um, the old school stuff. Um, if we do that, if we um, uh, offer them the test uh, every Monday morning, then they won't have been in contact with children for the previous 48 hours, so it won't affect bubbles going home. Um, but it will identify any of the teachers that are harboring uh, COVID. They can then be sent home, and um, it, you know it ha will have a minimal impact. Um, and uh, I think um, we've, we've tested that, that idea out with a number of schools and they're quite keen on that. The mm -hmm. um, reason that Harrow wasn't in that first group is that we didn't put our expression of interest in um, until this week. Um, we were, um, I, I think, I think we have, people have taken different, different um, approaches in it. Some people put an expression of interest in that said, Yes, we want to do it, but we can't tell you how. Um, we, we just put us on the list. Whereas we actually started looking at, well, who would we do it on, and how we, how would it work, and, and uh, you know, and then when we 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 were trying to develop a plan before we put a, a proper expression of interest in. Um, now I've realised that I don't have to do all that work. I can just say yes, we want to do it. <laughs> We've said yes. <laughs> So um, I've got a meeting with them tomorrow afternoon uh, to talk about um, you know, how it's all going to happen and when we might get our first tests. Um, I should imagine it's probably going to be at least another two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Michael Borden. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Carol and Andrew, as well for the update. Um, in terms of, I just wanted to ask, what what would you say has been the impact on uh, Harrow's care homes and the care home sector? And also, um, what would you say with the lessons learned um, from the first wave now that we're going into the second wave for both the care homes and the care home sector in Harrow? Thank you. You want to take that, Angela? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Carol. Um, 
So I, I think initially um, the major concern was around um, the PPE, absolutely. So there was a, a severe disruption to the market. Um, it was a critical time and I think that preoccupied um, much of the conversations that we had with our care homes and our domiciliary care providers and um, our the um, personal assistance that you, that you would have, um, that citizens have in the community. So that was huge, that was kind of a huge topic at the beginning. Um, but we're very fortunate um, um, through the work with um, um, some really dedicated staff at the, at the CCG and the local authority we were able to get the um, um, equipment out really quickly, the PPE out really quickly to the homes, so the confidence grew then in the homes. So, um, so I would say that was kind of the initial thing, and it was we. I suppose that some of the learning from that was how we galvanise as we work as a whole system, and it was really all hands on deck and uh, uh, truly a kind of a whole system approach to that. So as as we moved on, the other the other area was communication with our providers. So we set up um, almost like a daily forum so providers could come on. Um, Carol was very much on that um, uh, forum um, with um, staff from the council um, and staff from the CCG. Um, so that was another key issue and that we kept that. That was one of the things that we've learned that we kept going through. Um, uh, it was then being able to make sure that the homes had the clinical input very quickly, um, given the nature of COVID. So that was one of the other key issues. And that's something that we've been able to build on um, and very successfully in Harrow being able to kind of wrap that clinical support around because it's very important that the care homes, they're people's homes and quite rightly, we should look at the social care. But actually what this brought to the forefront was actually the the actual clinical need for and um, the medical need that you require within the home fairly quickly to ensure that people um, have the right treatment in the right place at the right time. Um, so then the other, as we've gone through, the other key areas are to ensure, I think that, um, uh, so people being discharged from hospital, if you're going back to the care home, um, that, you know, we have a place that the person can go so that the, the care home can be reassured that they're not bringing back the infection into the care home. Um, and um, looking at the sustainability in terms of where our care homes or care providers, indeed the domiciliary care providers, um, have had to, have had almost um, almost like a lot of loss of income because of certain ways they've had to work. How we have been able to help sustain them through that through different payments that we've made. So that's probably quite a quick, but there are a number of issues. But I think they're the key ones that that stand out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have Javina Seigel and uh, Councillor Leslie Lewinson. Javina Seigel, the Seigel, please. Um, thank you, Councillor Shah. I just uh, it was in response to um, the earlier question around the prevalence and the positive test for lateral flow. I just wanted to give you a statistics in case it was helpful. So from all of the discussions we're having in terms of the NHS asymptomatic um, a testing that was rolled out. The number of positives seen so far before it was rolled out um, to the 34 trust who took part as uh, first movers was 1.7 per cent. Thank you. OK, thank you, Javina. Uh, Council Councillor Leslie Lewinson. OK, um, yes, you mentioned um, that uh, household spread is quite worrying. And I'm just wondering whether um, somebody admitted to hospital accompanied by a relative and if they've been tested positive, does the hospital make arrangements or give them um, advice about getting tested themselves? A case came to a case came to mind um, for me to be aware of. Um, just a, a couple of weeks ago and I was just wondering what is the procedure? Yeah, so anybody who um, is, uh, tests positive goes into the NHS test and trace system and then their relatives uh, or the, their close contacts are then contacted. Obviously, if somebody is in hospital and is very poorly, 
what we try and do is we talk to try and talk to their um, uh, their nearest relative um, to find out about their movements so that we can try and identify um, their close contacts and that's part of what our contact tracing um, service is doing. Um, but yes, we would we would advise them to isolate for 14 days um, and if they show symptoms, get tested. Yes, I just asked this question because um, it came to my attention that somebody accompanied um, somebody into, into the hospital and that other person, the patient, was um, subsequently tested positive, but they weren't given any information of what to do or where to go afterwards. I was just wondering whose responsibility was that? There is, that's the responsibility of the NHS Test and Trace. So, so if, if, the pers if the person who is positive um, should be contacted and then it's their responsibility, the patient's responsibility, to tell NHS Test and Trace who they've been in close contact with. Uh, and there's lots of definitions about what, what a close contact is. Um, so we ask people about who lives in their household, um, where they've been, who they've been in contact with, um, uh, in, in less than two metres, who they've been in contact with in less than a metre, mm -hmm. if they've travelled in a taxi or on public transport. We, you know, we, we have about an hour's worth of questions um, with people. And then uh, that all goes in, in, into the yes, test and trace yes, system yes. and people are, are then contacted. Um, uh, it's, you're contacted by text or by email or by phone call. Um, depending on what what information we've got, um, but sometimes we just don't get the information, and sometimes the patient, the, the person with COVID, doesn't doesn't want to give that information, and then we can't contact their contacts. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. This was just um, I was just following on because a yeah. patient was admitted, and the relative was with the patient. That patient was subsequently tested positive but the relative was not given any further information. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, but so well, it, 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 some yeah. Um, well, it, it, it would still be the, the, rel the person that is tested positive would still be asked who their contacts are. Okay. It's, um, that, that's that's their, their responsibility to give that contact information. Yeah. Hi, sorry, okay, thank, thank you, Sarah. Can I invite Simon Crawford because time is running out and I want him to give his you know, update, please. Simon Crawford, so, please. Yeah, so just in terms of that specific question, if 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 the relatives were still in the hospital with the patient, then I would have expected our staff to give some advice and support. But if the patient had clearly left, then it would be down to the, to the test and trace uh, 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 service to, to chase them up. The hospital wouldn't be, ch be chasing them up. But clearly, I would expect if they were still in the hospital, then that advice would have were, were, should have been given. Mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a general update, I've, I've, I've have sent it on the uh, messaging update just in the interest of time. But so, so the current position today is we had 81 COVID positive patients compared to 77 this time last week, although that compares to 40 the previous week. So, so last week we did see a sort of doubling of the number of presentations that, uh, or, or admissions within Northwick Park for COVID positive, but it has stabilised over the last week, which is good because we were under pressure last week and did get some uh, support from system partners. So as of today, the hospital is busy, but coping. We've got acute beds available. We've got critical care beds available, got high dependency beds available to treat patients in a tight, timely way. And we are getting good discharge, good support from partners in terms of timely discharge of patients, either to home or, or to uh, relevant uh, care homes as appropriate. And the other comment I've made in the update is uh, Central Middlesex, which is one of our sort of planned green sites, was one of the early adopters of the lateral flow testing in London. So we started piloting that last week. That's been going quite well with our staff and, and will be rolled out over the next few weeks across all our services. Happy to take any questions. Right, are there Sorry, any questions for Simon Slackford? I uh, can I? Can I? Uh, thank you, Simon. That was really that was reassuring, reassuring that we have um, capacity at uh, North Park. Park. And, uh, you know, in the news, like we were before, 
that Nordic Park was not able to cope. So thank you very much uh, for that reassurance. Thank you. OK. Can the subcommittee note the update? Note it. I would like to thank everyone who came and the, gave replies and, you know, thank you to Simon Brown who gave reply as well. And we can go to next item, which is the last item. OK, so. Um, so in that's, the uh, Adult yeah. social guest would Paul Hewitt finally come and introduce the presentation. OK, so for members who will remember the resilient Harrow um, vision and the program, um, this is the um, developed adult social care strategy, which we're going to Health and Wellbeing Board next week. So I'm going to hand over to Angela. Thank you, Paul. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you've got yeah, the draft. Minutes, yeah. OK, I shall be. I, I shall you. be. Thank I'll you. take less than that. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you've got the draft adult social care strategy yes. on your screen now. So no, um, not yet, Angela. Oh, I can't see anything at the moment. OK, well, I double clicked on it. I do apologise. I'm not sure why that has happened. Shall I try once more? Good. If not, I'll talk through it. I do apologise. I am double clicking on it, so I'm not sure why it's not coming up. No, it's not. Yeah. Gosh, I'm not sure why that is not coming up there. I should try once more. Can I talk through it? Would that help? Sorry if I can't. Um... Yeah, that's fine. Go on. Um, so it was, we thought it was really important um, to um, ensure, I know it's a time when we're obviously responding to the um, crises within um, our response to COVID, but we thought it was really important that we had a strategy that we could um, ensure that staff were aware of where the focus is for adult social care. Um, so um, we were doing that in a way of helping to create a change in our approach so that we were able to work with our citizens to give them the right support at the right time. Um, the strategy allows us to plan together with a range of our partners in the voluntary sector and it explains how we want to um, improve working together and it's, it's an, a dialogue that we can open with our citizens. Um, the, the, our vision is really to build on Harrow is Home um, and have a, a stronger community, making sure that our philosophy is to support people to um, remain at home for as long as possible and make sure that they have the right um, care and support to do that. Um, make sure that the carers and families who want to help them have that and we connect them to the community services. Um, so our priorities are um, to put our citizens first at what, at what we're doing. Um, nothing about me without me is, is the mantra we want to use um, to help people remain at home for as long as possible, to support them to be as independent as possible. And we're very much looking at how we can use assistant technology to ensure we do that, to protect um, adults at risk, and also to look at how we continually um, look to improve our service by making sure we have feedback from our citizens on the service that they've received from us. So our principles are um, putting the centre at, at the care and support and they're in control of, of what they're doing, supporting people to enabling people to be able to take positive risk taking um, and to have shared responsibility. Um, so in the sense that um, the person is able to um, make decisions for themselves and we enable them to, for those decisions to work for them. So, um, we want to be accountable. Um, make the best use of our resources and um, be adaptable. So the, um, it's very important that our workforce um, is, we've got the right workforce with the right skill set to do that. Um, so and both looking at within the council workforce and the wider health and social care workforce in our, our provider services as well. 
So we continue to develop, develop that role with our um, workforce by working with our independent sector as well as our in-house service um, and our social workers. Um, and to put that strength based approach. So it's actually looking at individuals, our citizens strengths rather than coming at it from a point of of, of, of their um, their um, need for help, really looking at the strengths and looking at how they can connect um, in the community to do that. We're very fortunate we have um, a, a principal social worker who's a very experienced practitioner um, who's able to really work with our staff to make sure that we challenge ourselves and, and we look to change the culture. So over the next three years, we, our um, developers will be looking at how um, to develop um, those principles. We've got a very exciting project looking at working with our um, citizens with learning disabilities. It's called an enablement project. Um, and that looks at um, people about how they can connect back to um, employment, volunteering, how how they can make um, what they want as their as their meaningful life, developing a community support service, which is much more outreach um, to adapt for um, working with um, community opportunities such as ledger, education, uh, well-being, employment. Um, carers are at the heart of what we do. Um, we've been able to um, fund a, a, a carer's role. We will continue to do that next year to make sure that we're really able to champion the carer's role and how we support carers in the community. Um, expand our, um, our working to enable people to work with their strengths. So sort of almost turning around the old traditional um, uh, kind of assessment led process and that and go from um, really where we can help the people at the right time, at the right place. Um, as I said, we want to kind of, uh, expand our use of assistive technology to, so people can remain independent um, and to uh, work very much collaboratively with the integrated support team. Uh, so that was a whisk through of our um, vision. Hopefully you have got the document um, which was sent prior to this. And I apologise that I couldn't actually share it tonight, so. That's OK, we understand. Are there any questions and comments on the presenta presentation? Natasha, Natasha Proctor. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Angela, for confirming it was the same presentation that was circulated to us. I wasn't sure if it was a different one you were going to show. Um, one question I've got is obviously it's kind of a changing time with things that are happening and we're hoping to change different ways of doing things. How do we balance the training and development of the staff that we have with the pressures that they're already under at the moment? Is it taken out of their usual working day or is there additional opportunities or just wondering how like, the L&D impacts the everyday? Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a good question, actually, because what we didn't want to do is lose momentum. We started this what we're calling the three conversation approach or the strength based approach before COVID and we really were conscious we didn't want to lose momentum. So what we've tried to do is do bite size um, events. So we've done reflective sessions with individuals um, to look at um, celebrating success. So just before I came on the call tonight, I had a social worker um, call me because he wanted to discuss. He'd done some really good work with a citizen who was um, come from a situation of hoarding and the house was so bad that the citizen was living in his car and he had been working with him for the last couple of months and had managed to get him back in the house. So we're making sure we celebrate success, share that, reflect on if we haven't done well and do it better. Um, and um, I suppose what we're trying to do is do it in um, bite size and make it relevant to um, the kind of work that we're doing. But we're, we're fortunate with our principal social worker. She's been able to make sure there are focus sessions in the diary planned for the next three months so that staff have an opportunity. And I suppose one of the really good things about working from home, actually, is that people can just drop into meetings, Zoom meetings and Microsoft team meetings. And in some ways it, it's made it slightly easier. That's great. Thank you. Any more any more questions? <clears throat> Can I ask one question? Go on, Vina. Yeah, uh, thank you. That was a, a good, quick uh, presentation. Uh, 
uh, this uh, adult uh, and social care staff, have we got enough to support our services? Uh, I know at one time uh, we had issues recruiting uh, and training them, but are we OK now in Harrow? Um, so I think what we found is our response to COVID has absolutely stretched, I think, and challenged us. Um, caseloads have increased and we found that the complexity of the of the individuals and their needs um, has increased quite a bit. So, of course, it's quite right that our staff are taking more time um, to work with those individuals and support them. Um, so in terms of our recruitment, we've, we're actually, we've just put out an advert for six social workers. Um, we've had a combination of social workers who've come up for retirement, who've been in Harrow a long time, very long, but they've come up to retirement and they've retired, so we've just had to go out recently. We generally find in Harrow that um, when staff come in, they do um, enjoy the environment. So we tend in adult social care not to have too much of a, a turnover, which is very fortunate. Um, but as I say, we're just up with a number of staff retiring. So we, we're, um, we're just out to recruit at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? Can I, I just add on, uh, on the recruitment? That, yeah. At one time, uh, this is some years ago, uh, people from overseas were being brought in, um, especially from Indians uh, from India. I I had heard because uh, the, the, there's no language problem and uh, the social uh, care uh, uh, sort of curriculum was very similar. So, have we uh, got any overseas uh, people, or is it the visa issues that we can't uh, bring people from abroad? Um, so that you're you're quite right about similar training um, uh, uh, standards there. So um, to the UK, um, we haven't um, we haven't uh, at the moment um, approached that in our current campaign. But I'm aware that children's services do, and we have indicated that we'd be keen to join them if they're going to do that again, just to make it a bit more cost effective for the council that we do it across the people's directorate. Thank you. Are carers supported well? And you know, I'm sorry. Carers. Are carers yes. are they supported well? Well, no, we, we feel we could do better, definitely. Um that and that's why in a sense we um dedicated the resource um which is coming up um to a year in February, um, the carers post, um, so that we could um at, um promote um the support to carers. So um, Ali, who some of you may know, is a really passionate, enthusiastic um, uh, carers um, champion. Um, so she's dedicated to that now and she comes around to the teams and she's able to give advice and she's able to promote that. But it's something we continually have to strive to do. Carers take on a huge amount um, in, in the community and it's something we always have to, um, I think, challenge ourselves to do more actually. So. OK, last question. Does the strategy make greater use of the less latest technological advances and how does it addresses address the growing concern around digital exclusion? Um, what we're finding is actually there's a lot of talk about assistive technology and has been for some time, but it's not as easy when you try to look at how you want to roll it out to support our citizens. So behind, um, so for instance, there's things like they call them Ethel, which is a sort of a like a little mini iPad that you have in the house that you can connect to. But actually, when you look at the infrastructure you need to connect to make sure it's safe, and it can connect to a 24 hour call system, it's not as easy as it presents. So in one ways, it's quite an exciting time because there's lots of companies out there who are talking about all sorts of technology, but to make sure that we're making the most effective use of, of council funds, um, we're finding we have to spend a lot of time to make sure that we're very careful about which route we pursue. So we are, we, we do feel it's a good opportunity, but we're just a little bit cautious about making sure that we don't venture into something which isn't sustainable and wouldn't be good value for money as a council. OK, thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you.
Okay, now we are on the last item. Josk, has people read the papers? Yes. Yeah, so you're happy to accept the recommendations. You want to discuss them further? Or what would you like to do? No, noted. Um, I'm quite happy. I am and okay. I can see thumbs up from uh, Michael, is it? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. So can we accept the recommendations and finish the meeting? Accept yes. by me. Yes, yeah. fine by me, yes. OK, thank you very much, everyone. Sorry about whatever timing and everything, but I tried my best and tried to get everyone because all I would get is uh, somebody's hand up and 10. Now I don't know who those 10 people are, <laughs> so it's not all my fault. <laughs> if I missed anyone out, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. No, it's well, a a long you meeting, well, Chad. Thank you, Rachel. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much to thank all the staff care, and directors. Everyone. and everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And of course, councillors and CCG and everyone who was here tonight. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.